If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word, reading from 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. Starting in verse 13, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is there is sin that does not lead to death. And we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Billy, come on up. I'll pray for you. Lord God, I thank you so much for this place. I thank you for your church, Mission Church. I thank you for all the things you've done here. All these faces and people here, God, just ready to worship, ready to hear from your word, sing songs to you, lift up your name and worship and praise you, God. You're certainly worthy. Lord God, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you that you have called Billy to preach this morning, that you have filled him with your Holy Spirit. God, our hearts are certainly ready. Lord, I just ask that you just guide him through word by word, verse by verse. Just, man, I want to see change and movement here, God, for your name and glory, your kingdom going forward, moving us this morning, God, that we wouldn't just be stirred or emotional on a Sunday morning, but that we could take your word throughout the week, apply it, hold on to it, ponder it, chew on it throughout this week. We love you, Lord God. You've given us everything, and it's in your mighty name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. So my, uh, my papa all was the king of long goodbyes. Um, you ever have one of those where it's like, bye, and then like 45 minutes later, you finally leave, right? That's kind of how it felt with him. So we would have this lingering goodbye. I would go into his room, and I'd be like, all right, Papa, I'm heading out. going to be driving back down the road, you know, and he's like, all right, sit down, son, sit down. And uh, we would start talking, and he would always shake my hand, and there was always a $20 bill in his hand. Like, it was a surprise every time. Like, we, like we know what's going on here. I appreciated it. But he would then, uh, it's like he would forget that I had been driving for a while. He would just be like, now listen, son, be careful on the road, okay? Now, if you get tired, go ahead and pull over. Take a little nap. Okay, this is the 700th time you've told me that, Papa. I got it. I got it, right? Now, I love that because this is kind of what this last section of 1 John feels like, right? He's been going through this with us. We've been walking through 1 John, and now it's a sort of last minute. Oh, and one more thing, right, before you go. Really, this section is almost a summary, as it were, of the whole book. And John is, once again, he's contending that we have assurance, that we know, that we know, that we know, right? We've, we've put verse 13 on a banner up here so that you could be seeing it throughout the entire sermon series. And it's because it's the purpose of the entire book. Seven times in this section, he uses the word no, right? And that's because John doesn't want us to have an I hope so or an I think so kind of faith. He wants us to have confidence, confidence. Here's our big idea this morning. God's children are confident in Christ. God's children are confident in Christ. As we walk through the close of this letter, let's see where John wants us to be confident. And we've got some ground to cover, so let's just dive right in and see first it starts with confident assurance. Confident assurance. 1 John 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Again, this is John's whole point. This is his entire point, that those who truly believe would be confident, that they would be confident. Listen, if you've never relied on Jesus 
If you base your faith off of your parents or a one-time experience, then yeah, there should be some concern, right? If you fail John's threefold test of belief, obedience and love, then it would be damaging for me to come and coddle that false belief. But if you look at your life and you say, I do believe, I do believe in Jesus. I I fight to be obedient, albeit not perfectly, but I do want to honor Jesus. I do love other believers. I certainly not the best, but there is genuine love in my heart. Then John would commend me. He would commend you to take hold of this assurance, to know that we have eternal life. Now, here is the tragic reality as someone who uh, stands in front of you and talks every single week. It's that most of us have shortening attention spans. Do you know they say the average attention span of a human being is less than a goldfish now? Like eight seconds before you get distracted and want to move on, which is crazy, right? How do we fight against that? And so for me, there was this idea of like, you know, do I really want to like push reading? Do I really want to push these things? Like, should we, you know, do short form content? And, and everything in me just screams out, no, that we must fight against this kind of culture of quick, fast information, but rather sit and linger in the things of God. And so because of that, we, we put together and we invest in a resource shelf that's right across the way over in the fellowship hall in the building next door. And on it, we have different books. And one of those books that's on there is this book by J.C. Ryle, who was a uh, pastor in the 1800s in England. He wrote this amazing book called Holiness. Uh, whoever finds me first after the service is over can have this for free. If you don't want to come talk to me, you can go get one off of the resource shelf. This is an incredible book. And in this book, he talks about what what it is to walk in the way of Jesus, this idea that we are made different, that we are found in him. And and I really wanted to, like, there's a chapter in this book on assurance. And I was like, what if I just got up and read it to you? That's how good it is. Like, when I say that, this is legitimately one of the top five things I've ever read. It's that good. So I thought, well, you know what? I I, I shouldn't do that because uh, no one will listen to me read an entire chapter But he does this incredible job of asking and answering the question, why? Why in the world should you care about assurance? Why should you want to have assurance? Why should you want to know that you know that you know that you belong to Jesus? Well, he gives several reasons. One is that it gives us great comfort and peace. I mean, how settled is your soul in the midst of turmoil and anxiety when you know that you know that you know that you belong to the risen lamb? That come what may, Christ is yours. And it makes us active in our faith. Right? If you know that you belong to Jesus, you're not going to sit around hemming and hawing. You're going to want to get to work for him because you've seen that if he really did get up from the grave, then he's worthy of following. It makes us a decided Christian in a world that fire hoses us with doubts and insecurities. We can be found firm in Christ and it stirs us to pursue holiness. Now, maybe you're like me, and when you hear that word holy, you immediately think of like a, a preacher who's like blood red in the face and is wearing an old suit, and is like, that's what I think of, at least. It's not something that I sit around going, man, I really wish I could be. But yet if you open God's word and you see throughout it, guess what he describes himself of, not once, not twice, but three times, holy, holy, holy. God calls himself holy. That means set apart, other, different. And here's the crazy thing. He calls us to be holy, that we can be like him. J.C. Ryle says it this way, and I thought it was so helpful. He said, he who is freely forgiven by Christ will always do much for Christ's glory. And he who enjoys the fullest assurance of this forgiveness will ordinarily keep up the closest walk with God. What does that mean? It means that if you are confident that you belong to Jesus, you will want to walk with him. And if you walk with him, you will be like him, which means you will be holy. Here's what assurance produces. It produces a life, yes, that is holy, a life that has spiritual peace. I mean, the word peace sounds like a foreign word to us in our culture, does it not? Peace? Joyful love, humble gratitude, cheerful obedience, and the heartfelt pursuit to put sin to death. Now, does this mean 
you can't be a believer and doubt your assurance? Well, of course not, right? That goes against the entire book of 1 John. That's, that's the reason John's writing this. There's a whole group of Christians who are wrestling, struggling to believe. Ryle says that Christians can have the root of faith, but not the flower of assurance. I think that's really helpful. But to emphasize even more why I think that you should long for this assurance, I'll share an illustration that Ryle uses, and then I'll stop mentioning him so much. But you should read this book. It's that good. All right. So he says, imagine there's two English settlers who each receive an equal plot of land in Australia. They, they get this plot of land, and it's guaranteed by the strongest legal documents. No one's going to come against them. Well, one settler drives right into the work, right? He, he is tirelessly cleaning. He's clearing out all the debris. He's setting up his land. He never doubts his ownership, and he focuses solely on making this new land fruitful. Meanwhile, the other settler is plagued with doubt, right? He frequently live, leaves his plot of land to travel miles to the registry office, repeatedly questioning if the land really truly is his. He's worrying about potential flaws in his document. He's looking over them, seeing, did I mark, you know, every I, did I dot it? Did I cross every T? And his time and his energy, they're consumed by this needless inquiry of if the land is really his. And so Ryle asks the question, after a year, who do you think will have transformed their land into a thriving farm? Friends, imagine if we had such deep-rooted, gospel-settled assurance. Think of what the scriptures say, Isaiah 26, 3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Job 19, verse 25 and 26. Job, who, by the way, is just having a far worse day than you are, says, For I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Or how about this one? Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, what would it mean if we were so settled in our souls that we belong to Christ? Here's what I want you to do. So, so if you want application, if you're like, Billy, just tell me what to do. Here you go. Seek this assurance. Seek it. Right? Like your kid bugs you all the way up to Christmas for that thing he definitely doesn't need. This is something you desperately need. Bug the Lord for it. Ask God, would you give me this assurance? Would you settle my soul? Would you help me to know that I know that I know that I know that I belong to you? Would I no longer question or wonder or worry? Would I no longer go into work and be so beat down by my circumstances or, or so concerned about what's going on in the world? But would I look beyond the veil to eternity and see that the one who holds the keys to death and hell says, you belong to me. Would you believe that? Would you fight for it? And here's how you can do it practically. Start going through your scriptures, write down the promises of God. And you say, which one? Which one? Well, Jesus, we are told this, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. So the answer, friend, is all of them. Write all of them down and start rehearsing them. Now again, can you get legalistic with this? Can you break this in such a way where you can take it to a dangerous place? Absolutely. So pray against that. Say, Lord, don't let this become a thing where I become obsessed with it, where I, I try to bog myself down by rules and regulations, but let me live in the truth of the promises of God. Just like when I tell my wife that I love her and treasure her, that she would cling to those words and say, my husband loves me. Not go, well, how exactly did he say it? But that we would live in the truth, friends. John says that this kind of settled confidence, it results in holy living, but it also results in confident prayer. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Wow. We can have assurance in our prayer. 
Here's another quote from an old dead preacher, R.A. Torrey. This is what he says. He says, prayer, prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is and all that God has is at the disposal of prayer, but we must use the key. Prayer can do anything that God can do. And since God can do anything, prayer is omnipotent. Friends, we can pray confidently. We can pray confidently. We should pray confidently. You know how many times that like something happens and my first instinct isn't to pray? Like last night, Sam got bit a bunch by an ant. You know what my first instinct was? Oh, we got to go get after bite. I ran out to Walgreens. And as I'm driving to Walgreens, the Lord's like, you know, you could just ask me. We try to fix, we try to do. But friends, we can pray confidently knowing that God hears us. Someone that you should definitely read about who lived a life of prayer was George Mueller. He was a pastor who was a former thief. And God so radically changed his life that he gave his life over to not only speaking and teaching and preaching the gospel, but to caring for hundreds, if not thousands of orphans. And I love what he says. He says, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. I'll read that again. That is too... Man, the old dead guys, that's who you should be reading, all right? Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. John says we can be bold. We can be honest in our prayer, knowing that God will give us according to his good and gracious will. It's not just right to pray according to God's will. It's wise because God knows what's best and desires his glory and our good. Now you may say, but Billy, I've prayed for things and God said no. Again, God's desire is for his glory and your good. The same way that my son asked for ice cream for every meal, and I say, no, we can trust that God is good. Think of it this way. God wants to give you what you would want him to give you if you were wise enough to want it. God's will often differs from our wants, but here's the truth. His will is always better. It's always better. Romans 12 tells us that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. So I don't just want what I think is best for me. I want what God knows is best for me. I want God's will. Now, John gets specific And he moves on from petitions or requests that we might make of God to intercession. That is, praying for other people. And he commends us to pray for each other. Look at verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Okay, What does this mean, right? If you're like me, you're like reading this, you're like, great, awesome, yes, okay, what? Now, here's the thing. Unfortunately, this is where we can kind of miss the forest for the trees. I've gone through dozens of sermons this week. I've gone through uh, different commentators, and all of them spend so much time on this. So if you really want to go out there, you can. There's lots of speculation, and people get lost in the sin that leads to death. I think many of us would go, what is that? And we miss out on the thrust of the passage. So I'm just going to tell you what I think it means, and we're going to move on. Okay, so here it is. In the early church, the church would gather often to pray. As an aside, let's do that, right? Let's pray together. Back in. Okay, when they would gather, they would intercede. They would pray for others. And John has spent a lot of time in this letter arguing against those who deny Jesus, who deny his divinity, that is, the Gnostics. And John is saying you cannot pray that God would restore someone who is spiritually dead. But you can pray for the restoration of a sister or a brother. Now, John isn't saying don't pray for unbelievers, certainly not. If anything, he's saying, hey, friends, don't let your time be dominated praying for those who left you and followed after Gnosticism when you know that Sally hasn't been around for a while and is battling unbelief. So what's the takeaway? What's this? Pray for each other. Pray for each other. Like, look around this room at your brothers and sisters and pray for each other. Right? If you're concerned for a brother or sister, then before you go and say their name to someone else, wear out their name before the throne of God. 
beg God to restore them. Like some of you are in this room right now solely because someone prayed for you. Like you've told me the stories. So while I'm on the book train, another great book is a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala. I don't love all of his theology, but I think this is a really helpful book. He tells of his own daughter, Chrissy. She rebelled against God. Like as a pastor, reading about a pastor's kid rebelling against God, like my, my stomach drops. I say, Lord, please, not my son. Because she rebelled against God, she rebelled against her family, and she just disappears into the streets of New York City. Anxiety overload, right? He writes passionately about this experience. And several times I found myself again feeling that same pit in my stomach that he must have felt during those days. And one Tuesday night, Simbola went to the church's prayer meeting. And he asked the church, would you, would you pray for my daughter, Chrissy? And they did. It was a few nights later, she showed up to the doorstep and she collapsed into her father's arms, sobbing. She said, Daddy, Daddy, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against myself. I've sinned against you and mom. Will you please forgive me? And a few seconds later, in between her sobs, she pulls herself back, startled, and she looks at him and she said, Daddy, who was praying for me? On Tuesday night, who was it who was praying for me? It had been the church. We should be the church that pleads for one another. We should be so confident in Christ. We know that nothing else is worth looking to. Right? When we see someone broken in sin, we're not like, you know, what they really need is, no, because we know in our soul what that person needs is the risen lamb. They need the, the balm of Gilead. They need the comfort and assurance that only comes from Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said it beautifully in his address to the pastor's college regarding the power of prayer. He says, might not we win more victories if we more constantly used this weapon of all prayer? All hell is vanquished. We don't use the word vanquished enough. All hell is vanquished when the believer bows his knee in important supplication. Beloved brethren, let us pray. We cannot all argue, but we can all pray. We cannot all be leaders, but we can all be pleaders. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. I would sooner see you eloquent with God than with men. Prayer links us with the eternal, the omnipotent, the infinite, and hence it is our chief resort. Resolve to serve the Lord and to be faithful in his cause, for then you may boldly appeal to him for help. Be sure that you are with God, and then you may be sure that God is with you. We can be assured. And John keeps this confidence train rolling. And he tells us that we should not only be confident in our assurance, but that we should be confidently secure. Confidently secure. Look at verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, John gives three powerful affirmations in this verse. First is, we know that anyone born of God doesn't keep on sinning. What does that mean? It means that sin is no longer the pattern of their life. All we have to do if we are confused by verses like that is remember all the way back at the beginning of 1 John, he says, he who says he's without sin deceives himself and is making God a liar. He's not saying that you are sinless, perfect, this side of glory. He's saying that your life is transforming, that you're growing in patterns of holiness, that sin is no longer the pattern of your life. He's talking about how we walk with Jesus. The second thing is that he says, he who is born of God, he who was born of God protects or protects us. The CSB says, the one who is born of God keeps him. And the reason it says that is because the text here is clearly referring to Jesus, not us. We don't keep ourselves. Jesus keeps us. This theme is all throughout the New Testament. John 17, 12. Well, I was with them. I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Jesus keeps those whom are his. 1 Peter 1, 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Jude verse 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. I could go on and on. Watchman Nee was a Chinese pastor and teacher, and I love the story of him comforting a struggling believer. This new believer came to him deeply distressed. He said, no matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot be faithful to my Lord. I I think, Watchman, I think I'm losing my salvation. Nee was listening to him, and, and he put his hand on his dog's head, and he said, do you see this dog here? He's my dog. He's house trained. He never makes a mess. He is obedient. He is a pure delight to me. He's a good boy. Out in that kitchen over there, I have a son, a baby son. He makes a mess. He throws his food around. He messes up his clothes. He is a total, absolute mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. You are Jesus Christ's heir because it is for you that he died. We are Christ's heirs, not through our perfection, but by means of his grace. Jesus, by his work on the cross, has secured our salvation. And now by his work in heaven, right? We're told in Hebrews that he is petitioning for us right now at the right hand of the Father. He maintains it. Jesus Christ, the eternally begotten Son of God, protects us and keeps us safe. Here's the third promise in this verse. The evil one does not touch us. Now the word touch here means grab hold of something with the intent to harm. Satan might grab at us and tempt us through doubt, maybe through our friends or families, through idols, through fleshly desires, through worldly distractions. But because of Christ's power, he cannot ultimately harm us. Now, there's beautiful logic in this verse. The devil cannot touch a Christian and harm them in any ultimate sense because the Son protects us. And because Jesus keeps us safe, we cannot persist in continual patterns of sin because it's contrary to our new nature. It's contrary to Christ's nature. Our security rests in this. But John doesn't stop there. He goes on, verse 19. We know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So in stark contrast to the safety we have in Christ, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So as an aside, like stop being surprised when the world's evil. Can we all agree that that's like a good idea? That we should stop going, oh, they did it again. Like, of course they did. While we are secure, the world remains enslaved. As believers, we have this rock-solid assurance. We belong to God. The NIV says, we know that we are children of God. Eugene Peterson's The Message puts it beautifully. He says, we know that we are held firm by God. This confidence, friends, it gives us an inner assurance that spiritual death has no claim on us. Sin cannot dominate us. The evil one cannot ultimately harm us. But those caught in the world's lies are under Satan's control. He blinds minds. He snatches away the word. He deceives with signs and he tempts through desires and pride. He has the world in his grip. This reality means we are in a global conflict. Satan influences cultures, societies, and governments opposing the gospel fiercely. What's our response? Friends, we should adopt a wartime mentality. We should, because we live in enemy territory, battling invisible foes, not your neighbor, but Jesus is our defender. Listen to Jesus' words. (laughs) This is so good. John 10, 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. He's got our back, our front, and our side. Like Peter, Satan tries to sift us like wheat, but Jesus persistently prays and protects us. We might stumble just like Peter did, but we get back up. We repent and we are forgiven and we return to the fight. 
Jesus assures us that no one, not even the devil, can snatch us from his hand. He is our good shepherd, our great warrior, our full armor of God. Nothing can separate us from his protective love. We rest confidently secure. And John says all of this is because of what we see third and finally. We have confidence in our Savior. Third, we are confident in our Savior. Look at verse 20. It's a good one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. John ends his letter as he began it, focusing on Jesus. He reaffirms the reality of the incarnation by saying, we know the Son of God has come. It's Jesus who gives us understanding so that we may know the true God. This echoes Jesus' words in Luke 10, verse 22. He says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Verse 20 is awesome. Verse 20 is amazing. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. When I was 19 years old, I got asked to preach at a little country church in Winnegan, Missouri. No business doing that, right? I was 19, I was a head full of steam and got up and preached probably the world's worst sermon. And I remember talking about it and talking about Jesus being God. And as soon as I got done, I don't know if somebody invited Uncle Jim Bob, who's a Jehovah's Witness or what, but this guy beelined it to me and was like, son, I need you to have a seat. I want to correct you. Great start, right? If you ever want me to feel just full of love for you, as soon as the sermon's over, come find me and say, Billy, I just need to correct you real quick, you know. You know, if I'm in sin and I do it, go ahead by all means. But in this moment, I was so shocked by this that I just sat down and he said, now you said in your sermon that Jesus is God. And I thought, uh-huh. He said, mm, mm. God is the giver. Jesus is the gift. Jesus is not God. To which I wanted to say, sounds like you are a heretic, uh, I don't know why we're having this conversation, but he went on for the next 20 minutes trying to compel me. And I remember saying things like, well, what about the idea of the Trinity? Not in the Bible. And feeling so dumbfounded. And I went back to school. I was in Bible college, went to a professor's office and said, what do I do in this situation? And he just said, why don't you just read the book of 1 John? And why don't you contend to know God's word so confidently that it doesn't matter if someone comes to you with heresy, you can handle it. And when I got to verse 20 of chapter 5, y'all, I was like doing cartwheels and like, it's like, I hope this guy comes back to church. You better believe the second he walks in that door, I was ready to go. Because here's the deal, friends. This is huge. This is gargantuan. Again, this slam dunks Gnostic heresy. And it's so important for us to understand this. Jesus is the eternal triune God in body. He is the son. And catch this, we are united in it. We are united in him. You know what that means? It means that you're one with God, not in some weird mystical sense, but in the sense that you are being conformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. This is the union with Christ. It's way too much to get into right now, but it's worthy of our study because our union with Christ, we now grasp the truth of the gospel. Things that angels for centuries wish they could look into, we know on a given Tuesday because we can pick up his word. We are protected from the evil one. We know the Father and we abide in Jesus, the true God and eternal life. This union with Jesus, it brings us truth, life, understanding, all because we are in him who is true. Man, this this verse is so good. Like we could have done a whole, it's so good. But where there is a true God, unfortunately there are false gods. Verse 21, little children, Keep yourselves from idols. Now, at first blush, when you read this, you're like, totally like Grandpa Pastor John moment. Like, oh yeah, one more thing. It just seems out of nowhere, right? 
But if you read it in context with verse 20, it makes sense. We have to be vigilant against God's substitutes. Paul gives a lot of similar warnings in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. He calls out idolatry in forms of greed, sexual immorality, things that we easily give ourselves over to. The reformer John Calvin famously said, man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. We don't even have to try. We just automatically put false gods before us. Idolatry, friends, is the opposite of the gospel. And while I've been on the book Recommending Train, another great book is a book called Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller. So good. In the book, he explains that our sins stem from making something other than Christ our source of righteousness and confidence. And we do that all the time. Even good things can become idols when they take the place of God in our hearts. In essence, idolatry, idolatry is this, anything we love and enjoy and pursue more than God. See, idols promise life, but can never deliver. Only Christ, the true God, gives eternal life and true satisfaction. So guard yourselves from idols, idols of power, control, comfort, approval, idols of pleasure. These false gods will never satisfy your heart. They won't. They can't. You know what the psalmist said? It says, those who make gods become like them. You know why? Because those gods are dead. Only Jesus can truly and eternally quench your thirst. Right? Jesus said, whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never thirst again. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the true God, the only God who offers you eternal life with absolute certainty. All you need to do is believe in His name. He alone is the true God. Every other God is a deceptive counterfeit, a false substitute. They promise what they can never deliver. Jesus is the true God and eternal life. And on this truth, you can stand. You can stand firm and stake your eternal destiny in the one who is risen from the grave. D.L. Moody once shared a story that haunted him for the rest of his life. If you don't know who D.L. Moody is, he's kind of like America's like lesser Spurgeon. Okay, And if you don't know who Spurgeon is, we got some work to do. It's okay. Um, it's fine. It's fine. D.L. Moody was a Baptist preacher in Chicago and, and did amazing things for the kingdom and, and scores and scores of people came to faith. He was like old school Billy Graham. There we go. That's maybe a little bit more. Maybe that's not even modern. It doesn't matter. The point is D.L. Moody preached the gospel to scores of people. And he shared this story that haunted him. It was a moment when he realized he made a terrible mistake in presenting the gospel. It was in the fall of 1871. Moody had planned a six-part sermon series on the life of Christ. Reading this was haunting for me because I, I can see it. As a pastor, like, I've got this really captivating idea, and I want to do this, and I'm going to think through it. It's on the fifth Sunday, right? The next to last Sunday. It's October 8th. He stands before the largest crowd he had ever preached to in Chicago. So many people. And his message was centered on the question, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Moody delivered the sermon with all the power he could muster. But as he closed, he made a decision that would forever weigh on his heart. He told the crowd, take this text home with you. Think it over during the week. And next Sunday, we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. But that final sermon would never come. Because that night, the great Chicago fire broke out. It raged through the city for 27 hours, leaving destruction and death in its wake. Moody never got the chance to call his congregation to decision. The misopportunity burned into his soul. He couldn't shake it. He later said, I would rather have my right hand cut off than to give an audience a week to decide what to do with Jesus. So I am asking you today, don't wait. Don't wait. You have a decision to make. Will you worship Jesus as the true God? The one who truly satisfies? Or will you keep playing with idols? John's final warning is urgent 
He says, keep away from idols. Anything or anyone that takes God's place in your heart will lead you down a path of destruction. Friends, I've seen it too many times. Some of the closest friends I've ever had and walked with who see this alluring thing that thinks, you know, I can follow Jesus and this. Let me ask you this. Don't you want to know that God hears your prayers? Like to have that kind of confidence that knows that it's not just hitting the ceiling, but that you're ushered before the throne? Don't you want the unshakable assurance that you're protected by Jesus, the good shepherd, the great warrior? Don't you want to be certain of eternal life? That no matter what news comes from the doctor, no matter what horrible phone call awaits you, you have confidence? Don't you want to know the true God and to be truly known by him? The choice is yours. But don't wait. If the spirit of the living God is stirring your heart, do not close your ears to it because eternity is at stake. We do reflection questions every week. This week, we just have one. How will I respond to Jesus today? In a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to have folks in the foyer, that space past those double doors, and we'd love to pray with you. This morning, you follow Jesus, but you feel the alert of idols. Come pray. This morning, if you look at your life and you say, you know what, honestly, I don't know that I've ever truly followed after Jesus, we would love to pray with you. How will you respond to Jesus today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful. Grateful, Lord, that you would fill our hearts, flood our hearts with deep-rooted assurance that we can know that we know that we know that we belong to you. It's not on the basis of anything we have done, but it's on the basis of the finished work of Christ. Lord, we can have confidence. We can approach the throne boldly. We can know that we are kept by your sure, strong hand. When our doubts flood our minds, we can look to our Savior who has conquered the world. God, this morning I know in this room there are those who have looked to idols to satisfy them. God, there are some who do know you and have walked with you, but Lord, have faltered in their walk. Would they be good soil, Lord, that the seed would set deep roots, and Lord, would you give them the flower of assurance? God, I pray for those this morning who don't know you. I could get up here and preach my guts out. I could plead, I could beg, I could cry. But Lord, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless you, by the power of your spirit, awaken their heart, it doesn't matter what I say. And so, Lord, we beg and we plead and we ask, would you illuminate your word? Would you open hearts this morning? And would you bring people to salvation I'm so weary, God, of seeing people be the seed that springs up quickly but then dries out because it doesn't have roots. God, we ask for people to come to saving faith today, people to come from death to life, that they will respond to the gospel. This morning, if that's you, please don't delay. Jesus, work and power, we pray. It's in Christ's name. Amen.